Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, August 25th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, what if you could see Wi-Fi? This PhD project lets you. Then, after a string of victories, the food babe joins us to talk about her latest campaign and the full video that STEM Express didn't want you to see. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Oh, um, like, make sure the eyes are closed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the lab it's coming. Then I'll open the box. Yeah, oh, God. <laughs> well, it's being called Turnaround Tuesday. The stocks have rallied after the worst slump in four years, and markets have stabilized despite China's great fall. Now, Black Monday, this was the first time ever that the Dow has dropped by more than 500 points on two consecutive days. The Dow Jones Industrial Average plummeted 588 points. Now, if it would have stayed at that level, it would have been one of the worst single-day stock market crashes in U.S. history by a wide margin, but instead, it only turned out to be the eighth worst day ever. Now, the amazing thing is that the Dow actually performed better than almost every other major global stock market on Monday. Uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ both did worse than the Dow. In Europe, almost every major index performed significantly worse, uh, as well as Asia. Japanese stocks were down 895 points, and Chinese stocks experienced the biggest decline of all at 8.46%. So obviously... Smoke and mirrors here. Do not be fooled. We are in the midst of a financial meltdown, and it is truly global in scale. It's just going to kind of take a little while to unfold. There's going to be a lot of false props and ups and downs. Now, Chinese markets, they've crashed again. So it's the biggest collapse they've had in 20 years. The key Shanghai Composite Index sank another 7.63% today, extending its worst four-day route since 1996. And Donald Trump is warning that China's handling of this current financial crisis could lead to an economic depression. They're devaluing their currency, and by doing that, they're cheapening their currency, and they're making it very, ex very inexpensive. They will be able to make goods for far less than our goods. You know, we make great product, but it's impossible to compete when the product is so much more expensive. All right, so Eventually, they're flooding what they're money. doing, though, leads to depression, Bill. They're flooding the money. Eventually. All right. Now, as Peter Schiff and others have pointed out, the, the Chinese meltdown is partly responsible for all of these market jitters, but the correction in the U.S. stock market has more to do with a seven-year program of Federal Reserve quantitative easing that is coming to an end. But either way, there is some basic prepping that you can and should be doing. We're hearing this. Everyone we have on from Gerald Salente to Harry Den, everyone is saying, prep. You need to prepare, just like you have a life insurance and flood insurance you got to kick your prepping into overdrive. Um, so they're saying stock up on canned goods and bottled water. Get hard cash in a safe place now. Don't assume that banks and cash points are going to be open or that bank cards will work. Agree on a rally point with your loved ones in case transport and communication gets cut off. Somewhere that you can all head to. And also many experts are saying that you and your family should be able to survive indoors safely bare minimum one month because when the grid goes down there will be chaos and preppers will be the last man standing so be prepared now jeb bush is standing behind using the term anchor babies he's getting really sick and tired of being harangued by the clinton camp he's uh he's saying he wasn't talking about hispanics but asians when he was using the term anchor babies he says it's the asians that are taking advantage of america's laws he says uh, he was at a press conference today in McAllen, Texas. He is uh, visiting the border there with Mexico. So he's like, my background, my life, the fact that I am immersed in the immigrant experience, this is ludicrous for the Clinton campaign and others to suggest that somehow, somehow, I am using a derogatory term. And besides, he wasn't referring to Hispanics anyway. He had Asians in mind. He was talking specifically about the case of fraud being committed where there's organized efforts. And frankly, it's more related to Asian people coming into our country, taking advantage of a noble concept with birthright citizenship. 
Um, so obviously he is seemingly referring to the federal crackdown uh, that took place earlier this year in Southern California with these maternity hotels uh, taking place in California. That This was basically a lot of Asian women coming in and gaming the system. Now, we've been reporting on this. These are very wealthy foreigners from everywhere. So I don't know why he's specifically going after Asians. Uh, but let's look at the very real economic costs of birthright citizenship. Now, uh, the National Review is talking about a fascinating new Rolling Stone essay talking about Welcome to Maternity Hotel California, uh, where they're talking about the birth tourism and how it's confirming that the current interpretation of the 14th Amendment is being used. It works as a magnet for people to come all the way to the United States just to have their child here. According to Center for Immigration Studies, between 350,000 and 400,000 children are born annually to an illegal alien mother residing in the U.S. That's as many as one in 10 births. Um, now, illegal immigrants make up about 4% of the adult population, uh, but their children make up a much larger share of both the newborn population and the child population. Now, if you're taking into consideration that the USDA projected that a child born uh, in 2013 would cost his parents $304,000 from birth to the age of 18, that's a lot of money. But when you're considering that about 71% of illegal alien households are uh, receiving some sort of welfare, I mean, as 2009, last numbers that we're getting, uh, that means a lot of that money is being taken out of the government coffers, out of the taxpayer dollars. And, uh, you know, that assistance is guaranteed to people that are born here. So, and additionally, they have access to public schools, health care, and, um, you know, they rarely pay taxes. Um, obviously, a lot of those things are going to be changing. But, you know, Hillary Clinton, she is thinks that's just wrong for anyone to use those terms. Uh, you know, she is the champion for Planned Parenthood. Those babies don't matter. But don't you dare use a derogatory term. Comedian Bill Burr recently shattered the left-right paradigm of Conan O'Brien's audience and left them sitting in a stunned silence. Well, I mean, I don't think it matters who's president. I'm one of those people. I don't what? think it does. You I don't think it matters. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't matter at all. Dude, Hillary Clinton goes to those Bilderberg meetings. It's like the Illuminati stuff, right? She probably hooked up with some guy wearing like a goat's head, and then she goes out on TV. And she's talking to people who drive snow plows, like she can relate to them. Burr also praised Trump for his political incorrectness. And regardless of what you think about Trump as a presidential contender, I think you very much should pay attention to what he said about how he's gamed the system in the past. Before this, before two months ago, I was a businessman. I give to everybody. When they call, I give. And you know what? When I need something from them, two years later, three years later, I call them. They are there for me. So and that's get? a broken system. So you can find more reports on Infowars.com. A former attorney general is saying that the classified email scandal disqualifies Hillary Clinton from becoming president if she's prosecuted for breaking federal law. This is Michael McCasey. He's a former U.S. attorney general in the George W. Bush administration. He told Morning Joe that the law is clear about what happens to you if you are a custodian of public records and you, among other things, alter them or obliterate them. And of course, you know, she destroyed uh, about 30,000 emails from her private server. He said, number one, that's a felony, but that statute disqualifies you from holding any further office in the United States, and she's running for a further office. Now, of course, after denying that she had handled any classified information, now Clinton's defenders are insisting that the sensitive material wasn't classified at the time, but she is one of the top officials in the administration. So the kind of information that was involved, obviously foreign intelligence in some cases, is typically considered classified immediately. And that is a fact that Clinton was in a position to know. Let's talk about those emails. This is a story from WeMentWell.com. They say, as for any security Clinton may have used on her server, it's important to note that top secret materials within the government are not only processed on special hardware, they must be read inside of special rooms with physical security. Unclassified, 
classified up to secret, and TS slash SCI are processed and retrieved on three distinct systems. Employees have separate logins for each system. You can't accidentally send a classified document to an unclassified address. So for Hillary or her colleagues to have gotten classified information into an unclassified system, they would have had to copy it or just it into the class system while omitting the markings. Do you understand how how deliberate this all is? When he says uh, we uh, don't have, uh, I, I couldn't notice, I didn't notice if it had a .gov extension on it. It is far beyond that. He says this is a deliberate decision to ignore law and regulations. If you then use a non-state server and your personal unencrypted phones, the likelihood of compromise is high. And I'll remind you of what Hillary Clinton said uh, in the case of Chelsea Manning. Now, this was a guy that they've now sent to jail because he exposed the murder, the callous murder of innocent people from a distance, a video that showed that happening in Iraq. In December 2011, Chelsea Manning's court-martial was set to begin. None of the documents at issue in the prosecution was top secret, right? Unlike the documents found on Hillary Clinton's server. Manning didn't have any secret. But this is what she had to say. She said, well, I'll have to be aware of the fact that some information is sensitive, which does not affect the security of individuals and relationships, deserves to be protected. We will continue to take the necessary steps to do so. Hillary Clinton. People are abandoning that rat's ship. Now, David Knight is going to be joining me later in studio to discuss the latest undercover Planned Parenthood video that's been released. But he's right. People are jumping the Clinton ship. Now, one in four Democrats believe Clinton is done. Almost half of Americans say, Hillary, just give up already. So we can see that Clinton now, by the establishment, she is totally getting wiped, just like she wiped her server. Obama is now propping up Biden. He's given him uh, his blessing to mull a White House run. And of course, in, in picking between Biden and Clinton, Obama's making a choice be between two of the most influential members of his administration. Joe Biden, our creepy vice president, who manages to put his foot in his mouth over and over again. I've had a great relationship. In Delaware, the largest growth in population is Indian Americans moving from India. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. To fully, I'm not joking. What difference at this point does it make? Joe Biden is being courted as Hillary Clinton's replacement to keep the globalist, banker-funded and dominated New World Order train rolling. According to Politico, Biden is a beloved figure in the Democratic Party, a real stand-up guy, and establishment Democrats want him in the wings if Clinton for some reason implodes, which appears increasingly likely as the former Secretary of State takes heat for the email and Benghazi scandals. If opinion polls can be believed, her unfavorability rating stands at 48.1%. Biden has enabled the disastrous drug war and played a key role in militarizing law enforcement. He considers domestic crime to be a national security issue on par with terrorism and worked hard in the Senate to push through draconian legislation, including mandatory minimum sentences and the creation of a cabinet-level drug czar. I'm not only the guy who did the crime bill and the drug czar, but I'm also the guy who spent years when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee and chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee trying to change drug policy relative to cocaine, for example, crack and powder. Biden told Time in 2014. The crime bill that makes Joe Biden so great committed $10 billion in federal spending on prisons and $13 billion on local police. As a senator, Biden also pushed bills escalating the war on ecstasy and other club drugs, expanding asset forfeiture laws, and making the drug war more awful in any way he could imagine writes Ed Krayuski. Radley Balko, writing for the Washington Post, says Biden has sponsored more damaging drug war legislation than any Democrat in Congress. Hate the way federal prosecutors use RICO laws to take aim at drug offenders? Think Biden. How about the abomination that is federal asset forfeiture laws? Think Biden. Think federal prosecutors have too much power in drug cases? Think Biden. Think the title of drug czar is sanctimonious and silly? Think Biden, who helped create the position and still considers it an accomplishment worth boasting about. 
Biden's handiwork and an escalation of the drug war throughout the 1990s are directly responsible for the militarized and killer cops now roaming the streets of America. Since 2001, the Department of Homeland Security has given out more than $34 billion in grants to police departments across the country, allowing them to purchase military-grade weapons including tanks, armor, and armored personnel carriers. The drug war and the concurrent war on terror serve as a paradigm for a totalitarian police state. Since September 11, 2001, the government has added an Orwellian surveillance grid to the mix. This apparatus is less concerned with drugs and terror than it is controlling the American people and targeting political enemies. Remarkably, many Democrats consider this architect of the police state to be presidential material. Uh, the Morning Do Dot Com essentially uh, has a scene of Bo Biden on his deathbed telling his father to run for president. They will fall in line behind him when a corruption and scandal-ridden Hillary Clinton is finally pushed aside. For the rulers of America, however, it doesn't matter if the candidate is Clinton or Biden, or for that matter, Jeb Bush or any other vetted Republicans jostling for the nomination. The prospect of Joe Biden taking the Democrat nomination merely reaffirms the fact that the oligarchy in control of America prefers deeply corrupt politicians who can be trusted to carry out the police state New World Order agenda. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now, coming up after this segment, Vani Hari, the food babe, is going to be joining me to talk about her next mega campaign to get corporations to take dangerous chemicals out of our food supply that are slowly killing and harming us. But what about something else that is rather ubiquitous now? I'm talking about Wi-Fi. Now, a boarding school in central Massachusetts is being sued by parents who claim that the school's Wi-Fi signal is making their son sick. The parents say their 12-year-old son has electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome, and he's suffering headaches, nosebleeds, and nausea since the school activated a stronger wireless signal in 2013. The family is seeking $250,000 in damages, and they want the school to switch to Ethernet cable internet or turn down the Wi-Fi signal. Now, the school, obviously, they say in their statement that a company analyzed the Wi-Fi. They found the signal is well within federal safety limits. A number of people complain about these invisible rays, think that they're making them sick. But doctors say, you know, there's no evidence or link between Wi-Fi and illness. So it's pretty much certain that all of these safety limits um, and, you know, all, they're going to err on the side of safety. But the side of safety that's good for the industry, you know, all Apple isn't going to let you shut down their <laughs> cellular rain just because it's making a few people feel a little bit ill. Now, so it's not gonna be you know, good for society. Wi-Fi is everywhere, it is ubiquitous. And to help you understand that, three Scandinavian guys set out, on, uh, set out to make Wi-Fi visible so you could actually see it. Now this is a, an art project they're doing for their PhD. They set up a device, uh, it has blue lights on it that respond to Wi-Fi signals, sort of like the signal bars that you would see on your phone well, you can note the effect of the Wi-Fi strength on the blue bulbs. The stronger the signal is, the higher the dotted lines become. So by doing this, they can have an estimate of what the Wi-Fi coverage would look like if it were evident. So they've got this device and they are slowly walking through a seemingly pretty deserted area. And they're using a long exposure camera, about 30 seconds there, so you can actually see what the Wi-Fi signal looks like as they're walking through this, this campus. I mean, imagine how many Wi-Fi devices are set up in a, a large city. Every single house, every school, every business has their own Wi-Fi device set up. So all of those invisible signals are everywhere, all over the place. Now, you'll recall earlier uh, this year, Forbes reported on a study that actually suggested that Wi-Fi exposure is more dangerous to kids than previously thought. This is the International Agency for Research on Cancer. It's part of the UN's World Health Organization. They classify radio frequency electromagnetic fields as class 2B carcinogens. So radios, televisions, microwave ovens, cell phones, and Wi-Fi has the same rating as chloroform and DDT. 
and it's everywhere and they want to pump it into your children's classroom. So they're saying you need to limit children's exposure altogether, uh, you know, if, if it's not possible to just eliminate it, but, you know, really limit it if you can. Uh, they're saying children and fetuses absorb more microwave radiation. And according to the authors of the study, uh, their bodies are relatively smaller, their skulls are thinner, and their brain tissue is more absorbent. And fetuses are even more vulnerable than children, so pregnant women should absolutely avoid exposing their fetus to microwave radiation. Now, we spoke to Dr. David O. Carpenter last year. He uh, testified on this issue before the president's cancer panel a number of years ago, and he is basically wanting to dispel the misinformation that's surrounding the effects of a world addicted to Wi-Fi. And we're finding that a lot of these studies are actually put on by the wireless carriers who are, of course, are going to want to have a positive review of, of their product. But short of moving to a rural area, what can people do to protect themselves? Uh, we're hearing a lot, a lot more reports of this electro hypersensitivity. Well, you know, even moving to a rural area isn't going to be very satisfactory because uh, it, for example, with use of a cell phone, the further you are away from the cell tower, uh, the stronger the signal that generates is generated in the phone. So uh, wow. and there are cell towers just about everywhere now. Uh, so what can people do? Well, I think there are a number of things you can do that are relatively benign. Uh, you can avoid use of a cell phone except when it has a wired earpiece a wired connection. Uh, there's no exposure from wired connections. Uh, you can avoid having Wi-Fi in your house, or if you have Wi-Fi, you can put the router away from the areas that people are in. Uh, I think one thing that I see as being very dangerous, again, we don't have the solid experimental evidence, but the fact that the whole country, uh, and supported by the initiatives from the Obama administration, the whole country is is in a push to have Wi-Fi computer classrooms. Now, I'm 100 percent in favor of having every every school child have access to the Internet and learn to use computers, but it doesn't have to be Wi-Fi. It can be wired. And uh, there is so much evidence that at least some people, if not everybody, is going to be adversely affected by the excessive radio frequency fields that you would have if you have a computer classroom where 20 kids or 30 kids are sitting on their wireless laptops generating a room just chock full of radio frequency radiation. Right, and I, I hear a lot of the argument there is that it'll be more expensive to get, get the classroom hardwired, but it really, over the long term, it seems the cost would offset itself, just concerns for your health. Well, that's exactly right. You know, what, what is the cost of having a child develop leukemia? Uh, what is the cost of having a child in school whose learning ability is impaired because of these radio frequency radiations? Now, I need to say there that the evidence for uh, uh, EMFs impairing cognitive function is still quite weak, but there's enough evidence so that parents and teachers and school administrators should be concerned about that. And then we have this issue, which is still controversial, of electrohypersensitivity, that some people are unusually sensitive to electromagnetic fields, whether power line fields or radio frequency fields, and just feel ill. They, they feel mentally dull. They have headaches. They have aches and pains. Uh, sometimes they're nauseous. Often they have ringing in their ears. Uh, and they just feel unwell. Uh, now, I, I get calls regularly from electrosensitive people. Now, they're often referred by their physician to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. uh, with the thought that this is just psychosomatic. Now, for some people, it may well be psychosomatic. But I'm convinced for other people it is not, that this is a real syndrome where uh, some people respond to these fields with a greater intensity than do others. Uh, and I think that as a, as a nation that tries to reduce exposures and harm to people, 
we should be regulating on the basis of those that are most vulnerable and most sensitive to these these fields. I get calls all the time from people that want to know, you know, where can I go to live because I can't stand living where I am because of the neighbors' uh, smart meters, the Wi-Fi in the community, the cell tower next door, the cell tower on the roof of my apartment, uh, this kind of thing. And there aren't easy answers to those people, but they are clearly suffering. Uh, most of them, I suspect, from the radio frequency radiation or the power line radiation. Perhaps some of them are just uh, people that are ill for other reasons and want to blame the EMFs. But uh, I don't think that that the, radi the electro hypersensitivity can be passed off as being only a psychosomatic disease. It's not. Absolutely, and especially as there's such a, a strong push now to get the entire country on the grid, even though we have these vulnerabilities with, with hacking and things like that, but just at the very base level, there are genuine concerns for people's health. So you've got to remember, all of this is relatively new technology. It's going to take decades for it to show up as cancers or neurological disorders. We are the long-term test subjects. So the question is, which control group are you going to want to be a part of when the data adds up? Very frightening information there. Now, coming up, the food babe will be joining us, telling us about her latest campaign to get antibiotics out of the meat. Joining me now is Vani Hari, the food babe, fresh off your latest victory here with Starbucks. Tell us a little bit about this latest campaign. Yeah, absolutely. So Starbucks was really has been getting away with not disclosing what's in their drinks since the beginning of their company, if you will. And this uh, situation and transparency really upset me because as a leader in coffee drinks, as a leader in uh, fast food, and as a leader in, um, in a, as a multi-billion dollar company, I think you need to have transparency for the ingredients that you're serving the mass public. And their competitors like Dunkin' Donuts basically post their ingredients online. And because they were not willing to do this, and also because of some of my discoveries in determining that they were using very controversial additives and a lot of artificial additives in their drinks, I decided to um, write a blog post last fall, actually a year ago today, um, um, on the pumpkin spice latte and reveal what was actually in the pumpkin spice latte. And this is one of the most popular drinks at Starbucks. They sell, I think, 200 million of them a year, something like that. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And when I revealed finally what was in the pumpkin spice latte, the post went so viral. I mean, over 10 million people read it that I knew of, and it was covered by every major national network. I think you guys covered it here on the Alex Jones Show and Infowars. And I just, you know, what what really, I think, captivated people was, the, first of all, the lack of transparency, not even understanding what they're consuming when they're consuming these very specialty drinks. But number two, that they were consuming an unnecessary additive, caramel coloring level four, which is considered a carcinogen by the IARC and the National Toxicology Program and reviewed by experts at the Center of Science and Public Interest, at Consumers Union, at the Environmental Working Group. I mean, this is one of the most um, controversial additives added to our food. It's one of the most widely used artificial food dyes, and it's made with ammonia. It's not made with just like heating sugar over the stove, this type of caramel. It's a made with ammonia, and it produces these carcinogens. And they were actually adding this caramel coloring times two in the original pumpkin spice latte to color their drink and they weren't using any real pumpkin and they weren't using any like a lot of real <laughs> ingredients in there and so when people started to discover this finally starbucks made the commitment after this information went viral that they would remove caramel coloring from their drinks and also post their ingredients online now they've done one of those things just recently they announced that they're removing caramel coloring from the pumpkin spice latte. I mean, I have no idea why it was in there anyways. They, were, they weren't they were using it in Europe. And so when you call up the UK Starbucks and ask them, you know, is caramel coloring in your pumpkin spice latte? They never had it in there. So I'm glad they finally got it out of the United States one because it doesn't make a lot of sense coloring a drink that's in an opaque white cup. Right. Also, 
not only did they do that, but they started to add real pumpkin. And, you know, <laughs> I pointed that out just to just to be, you know, kind of snarky about what I found out about the pumpkin spice latte. But it's nice that they're going to actually add something real yeah. in terms of real food and their pumpkin spice latte. So this is a huge win for the Food Babe Army, a huge win for transparency. They're eventually going to post the ingredients in their drinks. They said they've committed to do that by early next year. We're waiting to see that happen. Their competitors already do it. And we deserve transparency in what we drink. Absolutely. And obviously, you know, I feel like these corporations can and really feel the backlash. They're feeling the pressure. A lot of them have already started to change their tune. Do you think that that's why you're experiencing uh, some backlash there in the media? It seems like people are kind of coming from all angles to try and discredit you, uh, obviously because of the impact that you're having on the food industry and on these huge corporations. Yeah, you know, um, this is a huge sign that we're winning. Mm -hmm. Like when people start to attack your ideas or try to criticize you, it's, it's because you've really started to make some major changes. And the major changes are happening when you look at the stock market. I mean, the, the stock market has been in the news in the last couple of days here, and it's been, it's been really crazy what's happening. And when you look at the conventional food sector, they're losing money quarter after quarter. They're not gaining market share. The only industry that's gaining market share are the companies that are doing the right thing, the companies who are organic and really natural and non-GMO. And so I am unfortunately shifting demand and shifting the, the funds of these companies. And so they're very threatened by myself and the army that supports this work. Right. And they're very threatened that we are, we are powerful to move and, and shape public opinion about their food. Right. And especially when it, it has just recently come out that you see these corporations like Coca-Cola are paying the scientists uh, to basically support selling us these toxins. Now talk yes. to me a little bit about the, the latest campaign that you're working on uh, just launched, I think you said yesterday. This is bigger than the yoga <laughs> yoga mat foam. If there's, you know, if there's something that could be bigger than that, talk to me a little bit about the uh, new Subway campaign. You know, the yoga mat campaign was it was very sexy because, you know, when once people find out that there's yoga mat, the same kind of chemicals that make yoga mat material in their bread, they act and they, it, gets, it goes viral. But this is even more important because this is about antibiotics, the overuse of antibiotics in our farming system. And Subway has a, needs to make a commitment to stop the routine of uh, antibiotics in the produ production of their meat. You know, they're, they are one of the largest meat buyers in this country, over $6 billion. It's estimated that they control, they sell 7.6 million subs per day. And wow. they're one of the, they have more chains than even McDonald's right now on the ground. And they opened up more even last year than McDonald's. And so they are one of the people that can really change the farming system. And the reason why this is so important is because the overuse of antibiotics in our farming system is causing superbugs and antibiotic resistant bacteria that basically can invade our bodies and not, uh, and we can't fight it off. So what happens is, is we either die or become very, very sick. And actually 23,000 people estimated per year here in the United States die because of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Over a million people are affected. Uh, worldwide, it's over 700,000 deaths. And this is something that these fast food chains and meat buyers have to make a commitment and develop a formal, formal policy around this issue, as well as a timeline to make sure they stop the routine use of antibiotics. And I'm talking about the antibiotics that they feed in very small and, and, and often doses to keep these animals fatter than they should and so they can, they can gain more profit from them. And then also the type of antibiotics that prevents disease because what happens is they give this antibiotics to these very um, non-sick animals um, to try to keep them well in these really horrible, overcrowded, inhumane conditions. And so we need to stop both of those practices. And what we need to do is only use antibiotics when it's absolutely necessary um, and, and make sure we reduce the amount that we're using right now. And 
big, huge fast food chains. I'm talking, you know, McDonald's came out with a policy recently. Um, Chick-fil-A has made a commitment to, to serve only um, chickens not raised with antibiotics. Panera Bread, Chipotle. And now we're asking Subway to do this. And when I launched this campaign yesterday uh, at about 1.30, I, I really didn't know if this was going to resonate with people. But I told a personal story about how my dad was, was infected by one of these antibiotic-resistant bacteria and it was a really big hardship on my family. He was hospitalized for over a week. It was a very scary time. And so this issue is deeply personal to me. And no matter if you're vegan, vegetarian, whether you support Subway or not, this issue can affect you because you can be in, uh, infected by uh, any of these bacteria at any point in time in your life. And it could, it could touch a piece of lettuce. It could, it could be in your water supply. It could be anywhere. And so that's why it's so important that we all stand up and be part of this campaign. And so when I launched the petition at foodbabe.com slash Subway Meat, I actually have the URL here and I also have the number here to call Subway and ask for this change, foodbabe.com slash Subway Meat. Um, I, I couldn't believe the response. We have over 20,000 people signed on in just one day, 20,000 people. So please come over to foodbabe.com slash Subway Meat and sign up for this petition. Petitions work. We've Absolutely. gotten Anheuser-Busch to release the ingredients. Yeah. We've gotten General Mills and Kellogg's to drop BHT. We've gotten Kraft to remove artificial food dyes. We got Subway originally to remove that yoga mat chemical from their bread. We have done so much amazing work with petitions, and they really do work when you when you sign them and you share them, and then you also call the corporate headquarters if you guys yeah. can all too. That would be great. Yeah, you got to hammer down on these corporations. This is the power of the people. Well, Avani Hari, the food babe, super effective. You are a powerhouse. We love the food babe army as well. Thank you so much for what you're doing to uh, help clean up our food supply. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for allowing me to be here to talk about this campaign. I really appreciate your support. Welcome back. Joining me in studio now is David Knight. We're going to be talking about the eighth damning video that's been released by the Center for Medical Progress. In, in this video, we have the CEO of the baby parts buying company, STEM Express, admitting that Planned Parenthood sells intact fetuses and also describing the organization as a volume institution. They just can't get enough of these baby parts. It's a lot of focus, Leanne, on the, on the profitability of this. And this is very important. This is the video that they went to court to try to stop. They got the restraining order. The restraining order was lifted. On Friday, we had little bits and pieces of this release. They released the full video today. We have the article on Infowars.com. So first of all, the profit aspect. Because if the clinics are making money off of this, that is prohibited by law. Clear and simple. Mm -hmm. So what they're trying to do is say, we're recovering our costs. And as we pointed out before, they said when Novogenics comes in, she goes through all the samples, she takes what she needs, she does the transportation, there's no cost at all to us whatsoever. They start out this video with this flyer that you can see right here. They say your clinic can advance biomedical research, then the very first subtitle is, it's financially profitable, easy to implement, plug-in solution. Again, they show some more. Advancing biomedical research together, emphasizing fiscally rewards the clinics. Then they say easy to implement and financial product uh, profits. They say it provides a financial benefit to your clinic, You'll also be contributing to the f fiscal growth of your own clinic. They emphasize the money over, over and, and over, over again. again. And as a matter of fact, wow. in this, we're not going to play, we're going to play some excerpts from it, but uh, in this one particular section, the buyer is engaging the STEM Express CEO. This is the CEO of STEM Express. Engaging her in conversation said, you know, I just want to make sure that it's beneficial financially to you. And she says, oh, and to you also. She says, yes, and to the clinics. And we're just concerned that, there's been a failure that some of the clinics aren't getting any money. And she was surprised and she goes, you feel like there's clinics out there that are getting burned? I, I don't understand how that's happening. Uh, that They think they're doing work for research and hasn't been profitable for them. And she goes, well, uh, no, I thought you were saying, no, 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 I haven't seen that. You haven't seen that, have you? So they understand this is about making money, right. but it's about other things as well. We, we're pushed back against this. We're told we have to have Planned Parenthood because it's an issue of women's health. So I want you to hear what they say about the condition of some of the parts that they get. They're concerned about how they arrive, what, is, what the contamination of these parts. Listen to this clip. Mm. Rampant problems with bacteria in certain clinics. <laughs> some where you're kind of like in question of really should they, you know, right. I've seen right. staff come out of clinics. So, I mean, I've seen wow. all sorts of things come out of clinics. So we're working with. Yeah, so what she's saying is we've seen staff infections, 
all sorts of things coming out of these right. clinics. And and we saw the atrocious thing there with the Gosnell case and just what his clinic looked like. Yes. And this was a key issue in the pushback against the legislation here in Texas. Right. In Texas, they wanted to make sure that these clinics met basic medical standards, that they had emergency care there. They said, no, you're just trying to put us out of business right. because evidently they're aware of the fact that their clinics are rampant with staph and other infections. Let's look yeah. at the volume that they're talking about. Let's play this clip where she talks about how many livers they need because that's a key uh, component that they're looking for from these children. We're working with, you know, almost like triple digit number of clinics. So it's, it's a lot on volume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we still need more mm -hmm. than what we do. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I don't think you're going to hit a capacity with us anytime um, in the in the next yeah. 10 years. In the next 10 years, okay? And there's well, a clip there where she says- What are all of those baby parts? Exactly. And the famous clip that we saw last week where she says, what would make your lab happy? And she says, well, we'd like to see 50 livers a week. And really, we need to take that all out of there. 50 more livers a week. Yeah, 50 in more. In addition to what they're getting. And, and she says, exactly, 50 more. We're talking about 50 lives here. That's what we're really talking about. Let's look at the gruesome admissions because this is part of what was released last week as well. One of the things she's talking about is the fact that neural tissue, in other words, brains, she says, are so fragile, so insanely fragile, they're the hardest thing in the world to ship. And so the buyer says, so you do it as a whole calvarium, in other words, the entire head. And she says, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the easiest way that we have this clip. Uh, you do it as a whole calvarium. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's the easiest way. And I mean, we've, we've actually had good success with that in yeah. the past. So, um, well, like, make sure the eyes are closed. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the lab it's coming. Yeah. Sit all open the box. Yeah, oh, I know. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Make sure they're that just they don't like these evil serial killers. They're always eating and laughing. And well, the interesting thing about this is now she goes into why. They, they have to be careful about this. In certain clinics, she says, the academic labs can't handle that. They can't fly like that. Mm -hmm. They can't open this up and see the head there. So then they talk about, well, you know, what, what are the kind of objections that they have? And listen to what she has to say about this. It's almost like they don't want to know where it comes from. Yeah. Megan's seen mm -hmm. that, where they're like, we need limbs, but no hands and feet need to be attached. And you're like, oh, they just want the long bones and they don't What's the problem with that? Them. They want you to take it all off. Like, mm -hmm. make it so that we don't know what it is. Yeah. It's like, bone the chicken for me and then, that's we'll, it. You know, so and like, then I'll eat it. But, but we not. know what it is. <laughs> wow. We know what it is. I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's truly like people that want to go and get their meat from the deli rather than having to dissect the animal themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. She knows what it is. She doesn't have a problem with it. She knows these other people have a problem with it. And then they get into the issue of why a lot of these academic labs want to get away from fetal stem cells altogether. She goes and she says, well, their lab techs freak out. They have meltdowns. So it's like, yeah. A lot of researchers, she said, ultimately they want to look at bone marrow. They want to look at adipose, at adult human stem cells. You want to get away from having to publish your research and show a picture and having to say that this was derived from fetal tissue. This has been a part of the debate from the very beginning, saying that we can get this same medical research from adult stem cells. We don't need to abort babies. But that goes back to the first part. That goes back to the money that they're making off of this. That's why they're doing this. It's the money that is driving this. They could get the stem cells that they need for most of this research. And as she's pointing out, because of the ethical objections to this, because of the gruesomeness of this, a lot of people are saying, we're just not going to do that anymore. So you've got these people like Stem Express that are making lots of money that are pushing this. And of course, Planned Parenthood is making the money as well. And so she goes from that and she goes, because these people have these ethical issues, we need to have people who are champions champions for the cause of abortion. Mm -hmm. That's going to overcome their objections, their conscious uh, objections. So let's play this clip where she talks about how important it is to have champions in the clinics. I just think you're either in the cause or you're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're not yeah. in the cause, like mm -hmm. they don't need you around. Mm -hmm. Get out. They need champions. Yeah. And yeah. if you're not a champion, you should go. Yeah. Because that's just, um, you know, and, and, and I don't know, the clinics, you know, they're very guarded, as they should yeah. be. Yeah. And who do they let in their house? They want champions in their house, right? So you're either a <laughs> champion or not. And if you're not a champion, you should go. Right. And she says they're very guarded in their clinics. She's not talking about armed guards. She's talking about very guarded in what they have to say. So they want to make sure that they have people who are champions 
of abortion. Right, and it's not the patient's privacy that they're concerning themselves with. It's, That's right. It's keeping their own things that they're doing behind the scenes hidden. We have a picture emerging here of callous disregard for human life, of profiting off of this, of understanding exactly what is involved in this, looking at other people's objections and laughing about it and saying we need people who are going to champion abortion. That's what this eight right. video in the series well, so you shows. See Hillary Clinton and, and most of the mainstream media is proving to be the champions that they need out there in the media. Yes, and of course, up. again, uh, with the other story that you had with Jeb Bush, where he's pushing back against the anchor babies, Hillary Clinton criticized him for talking, calling them anchor babies, and yet she doesn't have a problem with real babies being chopped up. And as somebody tweeted out, we'll just call them a clump of anchor cells. Oh, wow. And it's true, and that's really hard hitting. But I mean, it, just like you pointed out, it's not about women's health. When Republicans wanted to make birth control over the counter, Planned Parenthood pushed back. I mean, mm -hmm. if you if that's your big thing is that you are able to pro provide birth control uh, for people who can't afford it, then you should have championed yes. over the counter birth control. Yes. They didn't want that because that would take money out of their pockets. They wouldn't be able to bring in these potential new clients. Which well, is, we can know, see why agenda. they did not want this to go out. This is the CEO of STEM Express. They got the court injunction. They stopped this for several weeks. But now we can see the callousness and the avariciousness of this organization. Absolutely. And they can no longer deny that it's not about profit. That's right. The illegality. That's the key thing, too. The illegality right. of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, hopefully we will be able to get them defunded. Well, David Knight, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for, for tuning in tonight. We really appreciate it. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Take us to the next level. We certainly appreciate it as well. If you uh, help us out over there at prisonplanet.tv, your subscription gets you instant access to over 18 years worth of high def content. And we certainly appreciate all of your support. You are the resistance. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.